point out that we could argue about studies all day long. We could argue about my expert versus your expert, this study versus that study. The bottom line is that there are some very serious concerns about health effects, particularly on children, people with impaired kidney functions, elderly, some of our, of our most vulnerable populations. And if there is a question, we need to err on the side of caution and exercise the precaution, precautionary principle. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk and I host this series of half-hour weekly cable access programs. So to, today our guests are Rick North, who is with the Oregon Citizens for Safe Drinking Water, uh, and also Kimberly Kamansky. Did I pronounce that right? Kaminsky. Kaminsky, very close. Okay, who is the executive director of that organization. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Okay, Thank great. you. Great, yeah. So why are we talking about fluoridation of water here in Portland where we don't have fluoridation of water? Well, I'd like to start off by just talking about what is it exactly when we talk about fluoride? What are the compounds that we're putting in the drinking water? Um, there are primarily three chemical compounds that they use to fluoridate drinking water. One is hydrofluosilicic acid, which is a uh, liquid form. One is sodium fluorosilicate, and one is sodium fluoride, which is a powder. And these products, all of them, are byproducts of the phosphate mining industry. They are contaminated with lead and arsenic and other compounds, uh, other toxics. And Essentially, nobody's regulating these compounds. The FDA does not regulate the compounds because they're not approved for ingestion for the purpose of preventing dental caries, even though um, they are approved as a drug for topical application. So if you look at the side of your toothpaste, it will say drug facts, sodium fluoride, and if you swallow more than a pea-sized amount, call the poison control center. Mm -hmm. But the FDA does not approve fluoride compounds for ingestion for the purpose of preventing tooth to carry, so they don't, they don't regulate the products that are used for water fluoridation. The EPA does not regulate those compounds because they're consider they, they regulate the compounds as a pollutant. They don't regulate them as a water additive unless the amount of compounds in the drinking water exceed four parts per million, which is high. Um, and the industry that manufactures these compounds and the distributors of the compounds don't regulate them. They, they say, you're on your own. If you want to buy them, you can use them whatever you want to. We're not, we're not standing by the safety and eff efficacy of these compounds. In fact, they specifically disclaim liability for any harm caused by their, hmm. their products. Um, the only regulation that we have of fluoride chemicals is something called the NSF Standard 60. NSF is an industry trade group. They're required by Standard 60 to perform toxicological studies on these compounds, but when they're requested to produce the studies, they say either, no, we're a private industry trade group, we don't have to turn over that information, or they just don't have the toxicological studies. So the bottom line is nobody's regulating them. Okay, all right, well that's very interesting. So. Uh, we just assume, you know, when we're talking about food or things that we ingest, that somebody is watching over the shoulders of manufacturers, distributors, or, or whoever. Yes, but and in this, case, in this case, well, in this case, it's the fox that's watching over the chicken coop. Uh -huh, right, always a dangerous situation. Okay. The precipitating factor here is that the Portland City Council is, you know, uh, I've been working uh, kind of behind the scenes to um, fluoridate. Portland's water. Uh, we did not expect this, and uh, it's going to, you know, they are talking about fluoridating the water, something we haven't never done here, and the vote is coming up September 12th uh, for Portland City Council. So we are trying to get the word out to people about the problems with water fluoridation and ask them to contact the city council members to ask them to please vote no on fluoridating our water. Okay, all right. Um, what, what, why all of a sudden in, in, in Portland? I mean, this is not on the radar screen a week ago, and all of a sudden it's an issue which the city council feels that they have to vote on immediately. What's the sense of urgency? Well, actually, they've been working behind the scenes for over a year. They hired a high-powered lobbyist, Mark Weiner, um, to lobby City Hall, 
and um, Mark was responsible pretty much for electing everyone that's on the council. Um, so it's been this backdoor effort. There's been no public input. There hasn't been any hearings. We've had three city council people come out and say that they're in favor of it without hearing anything from the public, without any expression of concern from the people that are going to be drinking this water, without any opportunity for, for us to ask questions, to for the other side to appear and tell both sides of the story. And we really see that as a threat to democracy. Mm -hmm. It's not the way it should work. Yeah, but we do elect those folks to represent us and to make decisions. We elect them to make certain decisions. Mm -hmm. In terms of putting a non-FDA approved drug into our drinking water, I don't think that they have authority or jurisdiction to do that. Mm -hmm. And you think that it should go to a public vote for the whole city? Well, absolutely. I mean, there will be a, they will have hearings September 6th, okay? So people may get. S sounds a, a like pro a minute, forma at this point. A, a minute, uh, you know, maybe two, maybe three if we're lucky, but I doubt it. You know, so there will be some public input, uh, you know, but it's going to be limited. You know, for right now, we are limited to please contact these city council members. Uh, and as we get into this, uh, uh, hopefully people will understand why we, there are so many good reasons not to fluoridate Portland's water. Mm -hmm. okay. I wanted to add that I, I don't think it's my place to decide for my neighbors and my friends and my family members, well, my immediate family, but I don't think it's my place to decide for them what medications they should be taking or not taking. And I don't think it's right for other people to decide that for me or my family. And I think in terms of fluoride, we are talking about a drug. We are talking about something that's added to the drinking water to medicate people, not to treat the water to make it drinkable. So honestly, I don't think people should be able to vote whether my neighbor gets it or I get it. I, I think that that should be an individual choice. People should be um, able to make that decision for themselves. However, in the case now where we have City Hall that's basically mandating this by fiat, the better option would be, as Amanda Fritz has said, to let the people vote on it. Because I think that when people understand the issue, they understand what it is exactly that we are putting into our water, when they understand that we have some of the best water in the world, that most people will say, we don't want it. Okay, right. And I, I, I think the other part of that is that uh, even if it did come up to a vote in the, for the citizens of Portland, uh, many more people use our city of Portland water than just Portlanders. So all those other people uh, wouldn't have a vote. Absolutely. Like I live in Durham, which is down nestled between Tigard and Tualatin. Uh, we would be getting Portland's water because Tualatin buys uh, the Bull Run water from Portland. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so basically the citizens in these other cities, really uh, this is not even their city council, so that we're getting affected by it. So um, so it's a good point, you know. But yeah. but yeah, you know, in terms of the city council itself, you know, you have to ask yourself, you know, why, why would they? You know, why would they do this? You know, we've got, you know, we're talking about uh, we know that these have been, this is from the industry's own report, they have contaminants in them, like lead, like arsenic. Uh, we know from the EPA is determined there is no safe level whatsoever for lead and arsenic, and this, these would be added to our water, and so, and so why? And uh, the main reason I would say is, uh, like most people, you know, we don't have time to investigate every single issue that comes up. Uh, so we look to people we consider experts or trusted, and uh, you know, my guess is the city council has looked at and heard. Okay, the American Dental Association, the American Medical Association, whoever has come out in favor of fluoridation. So and they've got limited time. They say, well, look at all these agencies, uh, and there are a lot of them they've got, and say, well, this this is a good thing. So they don't have time to look at this, so they say, well, sure, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, but. You know, the, the impression that the pro-fluoridation folks are trying to give is, this is a consensus. Now, there's no question, there's no debate. Fluoridation is safe. Don't worry about it. Well, you've got to look a little further here, because when you start looking other places, 
uh, around the world, for instance, uh, there are 196 countries in the world. Only 27 fluoridate. And out of those, only 11 have more than 50% of the population drinking the fluoridated water. Okay? Their scientists take a look at Europe, where m most of the countries in Europe have looked at this and said, no. And they say, you know, for instance, an official in France said, you know, we've looked at this, we're not going to allow it based on both ethical and medical reasons. Ethical, you know, like this is mass medication, you know, these are, you know, you don't, you're not giving any consent to getting a drug in your water here. Uh, you know, Sweden, the official from Sweden said, you know, we didn't flor fluoridate, I'm paraphrasing here, but, you know, we haven't fluoridated, but, you know, we've looked at the science that's come in since then, we see no reason to change our mind. So. Most of the world has looked at this and they're just not fluoridating, and a lot of them for health and safety reasons. There's no, ab if, there, if you don't hear anything else, you know, there is absolutely no consensus on the safety of water fluoridation. There are very serious questions and a lot of evidence pointing in the other direction. And, but yet, for listening to most of the proponents of fluoridation, you would not think that there was any question about the uh, safety of fluoride. No, you wouldn't. No, okay. no, no. I mean, they're going to insist that, oh, this is absolutely safe. You know, oh, at, the, at the levels we're talking about, it's absolutely safe. You know, and, uh, you know, what's, what's interesting is that, uh, you know, uh, back in uh, 1986, uh, it was established that, okay, four parts per million of fluoride in water. That was safe. Okay, Th this was the story. It was given to everybody, you know, from the government, from agencies, this was the story. Well, in 2006, uh, this, is, this was the result of this, uh, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Research Council of the National Academy of Sciences put together a committee and they investigated this. Uh, and out of that came this 507 page report and you start looking at this and you think, oh my gosh, you know, there are all kinds of scientific questions in here, you know, uh, on you name it, fluorosis, uh, bone disease, uh, thyroid, kidneys, uh, what am I forgetting? Well, the IQ studies, and we'll get to that, you know, sometime, you know, during this show, uh, all kinds of questions. So. There was no consensus at all in the National Academy of Sciences is considered, you know, the, the golden kind of, you know, the gold standard mm -hmm. for scientific inquiry. And after they came out and they looked at this and they said four parts per million, uh, no, this is not safe for human health. Uh, you know, it has to be lower. So things keep going like this. So what we were told before as being perfectly safe now necessarily isn't, now they're saying, well, it isn't perfectly safe. And I mean, our belief absolutely is what they're saying is safe now will in the future, you know, be found out to be not safe at all. Yeah, because we recently had some other, and I forget, you probably know, some other standards of other chemicals or additives uh, that we thought were safe at a certain level, and recently those have, have been reduced. Well, uh, absolutely. Well, look at the history of substances in the United States, uh, lead, lead, asbestos, mm -hmm. tobacco, uh, DES, uh, DDT, thalidomide, all of these at one time, the government, the manufacturers were saying, these are perfectly safe folks, okay? Well, then Don't the worry, research gets us. done and, uh, <laughs> and guess what? Huh. They weren't. And water fluoridation is going right down that same path. Uh -huh. I just wanted to add yes. that even if we assume that fluor water fluoridation is good for our teeth, we're not looking at the effects that we're having on the rest of our body. Rick pointed out a number of those effects on the endocrine system, the thyroid gland. Um, what the National Academy report said in large part is that, is it associated with Alzheimer's disease? We don't know. There could be an association. Is there an association with Down syndrome? We don't know. It's biologically plausible. The bottom line is there are many studies that have not been done. And we're having a lot of IQ studies coming out of China and India 
uh, where there's naturally occurring high, high levels of naturally occur occur occurring fluoride, and they're showing a negative association with children's IQ, even at levels as low as 1.8 parts per million. Now we're fluoridating probably at 0 0.7, but the the problem with that is that there's no margin of safety. We don't know how much fluoride we're getting from other sources. We get fluoride from pharmaceuticals. We get fluoride from pesticide residues. We get fluoride um, from airborne emissions. So if we don't know how much we're already getting, we're adding it to the drinking water. We are starting to really approach a negative margin of safety for, for those things. The bottom line, too, is those studies aren't being done in this country. You know, they say, well, these studies are doing, done in China. That's because we're not doing them here. Mm. Where are the studies being done that show the negative effects? Those studies aren't being funded. Let's, yeah, go ahead. Just, and just uh, go back to the city council for a minute. You know, like, we don't think they've got the information from our side, because some of it's very new. This, you know, the National Academy of Sciences, and, and IQ is one of my big things, uh, you know, to, you know, as a real concern of this. When they looked at this, uh, you know, they, they studied four, uh, four studies. And just based on that, and, and the studies had weaknesses, and they were talking about, you know, higher levels of fluoride in the water there that were lowering IQ than what we get in the fluoridation water. Now, okay, all of that, they weren't perfect by any means, but Nevertheless, based on that, they said, you know, there's a consistency here. Every one of them are showing high fluoride, lower, lower IQ. We need to really research this, okay? Nothing got done. That was six years ago, okay? Just weeks ago, a meta-analysis, which is simply a big word for saying that uh, scientists have uh, looked at a bunch of studies in the same subject. They looked at 27 studies, not just four, 27. And 25 of them showed the same thing. High fluoride level, lower IQ. And they came out and said they really, really, you know, need to have more research. This. Said the same thing. The studies weren't perfect. A number of them were, you know, had weaknesses. Uh, or notwithstanding, they're epidemiological studies. They're not easy to do in the first place. But just based on the consistency, you know, how can you look at that? So we really question whether the city council members have even heard about this or seen it. Because uh, if ever there was a red flag here that's crying out you know, for more study, more research, this is it. And yet, the same thing Kim said, you know, because a lot of people that are pro-fluoride will look at that and say, well, they're in China, you know, they've got mm -hmm. weaknesses and like that. Well, how come you're not doing, doing them in the United States? And they're not doing them. And this is, this is a real, real concern. Yeah. I also wanted to point out that we could argue about studies all day long. We could argue about my expert versus your expert, this study versus that study. The bottom line is that there are some very serious concerns about health effects, particularly on children, people with impaired kidney functions, elderly, some of our, of our most vulnerable populations. And if there is a question, we need to err on the side of caution and exercise the precaution, precautionary principle. I was Absolutely. just going to ask about yeah. the precautionary principle and how that applies. Well, obviously, the precautionary principle says that unless you know that it's actually safe to use, you don't do it until you know that for sure. Yes. In yeah. this case, with fluoride, um, most city, most large cities in the United States have taken the op opposite approach and said, yeah, let's use it and then hope. Uh, hope it's safe. Right. Yeah. Well, Portland and Multnomah County have both adopted the precautionary principle. And so I think that this practice in general flies in the face of that. I also wanted to address the issue of um, proponents of fluoridation say, but it's going to help the lower income children. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk about that for a minute because I think it's important and I think it, it pulls at people's heartstrings. And as a mom, I definitely can relate mm -hmm. to that. Um, I just want to say that I think dumping a waste byproduct into the drinking water that's contaminated with lead and arsenic and other toxins is not good for our children. And there are better, more targeted means of accomplishing children's dental health. We fluoridate 100% of the water. We drink 1% of it. The rest of it's going down the drain. Now we're talking about products we can't jump in the ocean, we can't dump in the rivers, we can't put in a landfill. 
they would have to pay to dispose of these chemicals in a toxic waste facility. So by selling them to municipalities and by not having to pay to dispose of them, the phosphate fertilizer industry is making hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe millions of dollars. I don't know what the figures are, but they're making money by not having to properly dispose of these compounds. We put it in our drinking water and we're not really addressing the issue of access to dental care. We're not ac addressing the fact that we should be teaching children how to brush their teeth. We should be teaching parents how to brush their children's teeth and their own teeth. We should be t talking about diet. I saw an article in the Oregonian, one in five children um, are obese. I mean, that tells me that we definitely need to talk about dietary issues. The children that are suffering from poor health are probably not the ones that are drinking the water. And there needs to be more effective ways of addressing this issue than fluoridating everyone's water. Okay. I, looked at, uh, I, I looked at your very informative website, uh, which I highly recommend to people to Thank go to and take a look at. Uh, one of the tabs was about I environmental hazards or just the environment. Uh, talk just a little bit about the environmental. I, if I could just add, because sure. I do want to get to that, but just add one more thing regarding this whole thing. Obviously, we don't want uh, you know poor people to suffer at all like that, but you know this is not something we're out to do. Uh, or rich people either, for that yeah, matter, right. or anybody <laughs> in the middle. We, you know, we really don't want anybody to. And, um, this isn't fluoridated, is it? I just, I just <laughs> want to make sure. That's, I, you that's, know, that's okay. run water. Uh, so. <laughs> good. Okay. So, uh, but the point is, if you were, uh, something that's come out is that babies, you know, from the time of birth to one year old, should not be drinking fluoridated water because it can really lead to fluorosis, which is a modeling of the teeth, and it's a very, can be a very disfiguring uh, malady. And uh, so the recommendations are, you know, don't, you know, even if you got fluoridated water, you know, uh, not for babies, not for them to drink or put in infant formula if you're mixing it in. And put yourself in the place now of young parents in Portland or Tualatin or wherever, uh, put yourself in their place to have a baby. And suppose they're poor. And in the first place, they may not even know this, okay, because it sure doesn't get out there very much. Mm -hmm. uh, but suppose they did, now they've got a choice. They can either buy all this bottled or distilled water, um, you know, very expensive uh, to mix their formula for the baby to drink, uh, or they can get a very expensive water filter. And they're not, and the ones that can actually, most water filters will not remove uh, fluoride. They're very, they're very expensive. So they're stuck. We're not helping the poor here at all. Uh, you know, they either, most of them just simply cannot afford this or they have to have real concerns about the health of their babies. So this doesn't get brought up mm -hmm. and, uh, and it needs to be brought up. Yeah. I okay. wanted to talk about also um, quickly, um, mother's milk has very low levels of fluoride, 0 0.004. When we give a baby infant formula that's mixed with fluoridated water, they're getting 250 times the level of mother's milk. And as Rick pointed out, it's really not an option for them to buy bottled water, for low-income people to buy bottled water. And, you know, you have to truck it on the bus. A lot of people take mass transit. It's not easy to carry, especially if you're juggling a toddler and a baby. And, mm -hmm. and um, the other point is, too, I think low-income populations are more susceptible to ha fluoride's harm because we know that if you have a poor diet, you don't have enough calcium, you're not getting enough iodine, that you're going to be more susceptible to the harms from fluoride compounds. Mm -hmm. and, and so the presence of these other things helps offset the effects of fluoride? And so if yes. poor people don't have them, then they're more susceptible to them. Correct. Calcium uh, affecting the bones in the teeth and oh. iodine affecting the thyroid and endocrine. Okay. okay great. We, we have about uh, three and a half minutes, so okay. maybe a concluding statement from each of you. Uh, well, just your point about the environment. There are a number of environmental oh, yeah. organizations, without getting into details, there are, uh, you know, Willamette River Keepers, uh, very concerned about the possible effects on fish. So just, just to, you know, there are definitely environmental concerns too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just uh, in terms of a closing statement, 
just like to say that, um, you know, I used to think that fluoridation was great. I thought it was fine for years and years mm -hmm. until I sat down to study science on it. And I just thought, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. I was amazed and I was chagrined. And that was about five years ago. I have probably put in hundreds and hundreds of hours of study on this. And I can tell you, I'm learning all the time. The more I learn, the more concerned I am about fluoride. So I really, you know, really recommend to people, uh, call the city council members, email them, ask them, please do not do make this decision for us. Uh, you know, don't do it, uh, better safe than sorry. Well, I got involved in this issue because I have small children, and um, back in 2007, they were talking about fluoridating uh, the water supply at a statewide level, and that's when I started learning about the issue. And again, I, I had the same reaction. I thought it was great, and then I started reading, and then I realized that there's a lot of questions. I would urge people to um, check out our website. It's www.cleanwaterportland.org. Um, we also have um, safewateroregon.org, and that's more of a statewide. Um, so there's state uh, safewateroregon.org, cleanwaterportland.org, and there's also another one called Fluoride Free Portland. And we have information about rallies and things that people can do to get on board and, and help out with this issue. I, we have some of the best water in the world, and I urge everyone to uh, look into this issue and to call City Hall. Great, good. Thank you both for being here. It's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you, Dave. Great, good. Uh, so future actions, obviously uh, Rick has said that the Portland City Council will have a hearing on this, so we recommend that people get to that hearing and we'll have that information on the screen as, as I'm talking. Um, there's also several books. Those, uh, the titles of those books will be on the screen uh, as well. Never miss an episode of Populist Dialogues again. Want to watch an episode again? Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year and to subscribe. We're also available on blip.tv. Search for Populist Dialogues. Subscription is available there also. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Learn more, visit our national website at thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at www.afd-pdx.org. Thanks to our crew today for being here, Roger Bates, Joan Horton, uh, Dave King, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas, and thanks to you, the audience, for watching. We hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.